Okay, hello students, welcome to another lecture for ComSci 1 to 5 operating systems. Here is our main textbook operating systems, three easy pieces by Ramsey and Andrea from the University of Wisconsin. Well, let's get started. Introduction to operating systems. So, in this slide, let's take a look at what happens when a program runs. I'm sure everyone is familiar with these steps already because you've taken Comsci, several Comsci courses already. But let's have a review. So, run a program executes instructions and it is the processor that fetches the instruction from memory and we have in the case of x86-64 which is the ISA that you studied in ComSci 131 we have a special register called the instruction pointer which basically contains the address of the next instruction to be executed. Now, once that instruction is fetched, it will be decoded to figure out which instruction this is. And after it has determined the operation or instruction, so usually you are given the opcode. Right? And then the opcode uh, will be decoded and the particular or the specific instruction will be extracted and it will be executed. For example, if you have an add instruction or a move instruction. So these instructions are implemented at the hardware level. So for example, if you have another instruction, at the circuit level, it will be implemented as a full other, as you discussed in COMSI 130. Now, after the execution of this instruction, the next instruction will be uh, fetched and the process continues. This is called the von Neumann architecture, which is the model of computing that is being implemented in the computers that we have today. Now let's take a look at the operating system. Now the idea here is the OS is responsible for making it easy to run programs. An example of this will be, let's say if you're trying to assemble your own gaming rig, so you have to buy your own processor, your own motherboard, some uh, memory or and then storage, secondary storage. Then you assemble these hardware components because you want to play your to, well, you have to play a new game. But without an operating system, you even though you have all the hardware resources, you will not still be able to play the new game because the hardware by itself, by themselves, cannot or does not offer a way to run your uh, game program. So that's why an operating system is important. The second one is it allows program to share memory. When you, although initially when you, when you're trying to assemble your gaming rig, the main objective or the main purpose of that setup is for gaming. Of course, you would like to use it for other purpose like programming or surfing or word processing. And if you have the memory for that particular setup, you don't want the memory to be used for gaming only. The memory should also be used by the other tasks that you would like to do on your computer. So the operating system actually provides a way to share this memory, especially if you have a limited memory. Typical today is an 8GB 
RAM or amount of memory is 8 gig. So this 8 gig RAM will be shared by different programs, games, and other applications. And of course, the last one is it enables programs to interact with devices. So if, if you have a word processor and you're typing a document and you would like to print your document, you want the word processor to be able to print the document. Now, is the operating system that actually provides or that provides the interface for the word processor to be able to access the printer and print the document and also for storing the document that you that you are editing to the disk so it is the operating system that provides uh, that interface so in general the OS is in charge of making the system operate correctly efficiently and in an easy to use manner. Now, you might wonder how is this accomplished by the operating system. The primary way to do that is through virtualization. As I've said earlier, if you're assembling a gaming rig, you're going to spend some money buying the physical resource, the processor, the RAM, the storage. Uh, these are the physical resources. Now, the, what the operating system does is to transform these physical resources into virtual resources, uh, somehow a clone of itself. But uh, the idea here is this virtual form is more general, more powerful, and easier to use than the physical resource in itself. So that's why operating system is often referred to as a virtual machine. So let's say we have the memory as the physical resource and the CPU here, the triangle. So what the operating system does is to create some form of layer to expose this as virtual resources. So that's why the OS is a form of a virtual machine. So hey, we now know that the OS is responsible for uh, these different uh, objectives. Right? How does the OS, how does the application or the user tell the OS what to do and that is accomplished via system calls and the OS provides uh, some form of an interface or an API or standard library API stands for application programming interface that these are basically functions that can be called so that the operating system will perform the particular operation and an operating system has usually a hundred system calls categorized uh, into different categories like running a program, accessing memory, and accessing device files. Let's take a look at an example uh, in, in Linux. Okay, so We can use the man page in Linux to check the list of system calls that are available or provided by Linux. So you should, as you know already that Linux has several versions already, several released versions already, but some system calls are retained, some are modified, some are removed, but there are some common uh, or still uh, long last, uh, uh, long lived uh, system calls. So let's take an example. Uh, this one here, clone. So this is a system call. This was uh, released since this syscall is 
available since the first version of the Linux kernel. So let's review the map page. Mm. So we're talking about system calls. So man. So the description of the system call states that it creates a child process. So we're, we're going to talk about this later, but this is uh, what this particular system call does. So when a program, an application, my, I write a C program and I call this function, I am actually talking to the operating system, hey operating system, create a child process. Okay, so that's what we mean by uh, system call. So uh, at this point, you can just think of this as the way for users to make use of the services provided by the operating system. Now let's take a look at the OS as a resource manager. Uh, so note again that we have physical resources, CPU, memory, and the disk, and the OS can be thought, uh, can be considered as a resource manager because it manages these resources. For example, uh, the OS allows many programs, many programs to run on a single CPU via CPU sharing. So the OS is responsible for doing that. I, I will choose this particular program to run now and then I will select the next program to run later. The OS also allows many programs to concurrently access their own instructions and data. So in a way it's called sharing memory. Uh, later when we talk about inter-process communications we're going to talk about shared memory where in different programs can share a specific region of memory where they can both uh, two processes or different processes can read and write on that particular region of memory and also many programs uh, to access devices right, like this right? So word processor, compiler, text editor can access the same C source code that you are working on. So all in all, the OS as a resource manager will need to manage or will need to have different goals when it comes to managing these resources, for example, fairness. So the idea here of fairness is you don't want to allow one process or one program to hug the processor. You would like, for example, to give chance to other programs also to use the processor. Another one is efficiency. So you have to do some, or to implement some policy to make sure that time critical programs will finish first because they, need, they are time constrained. Okay, so that's uh, those are the goals when it comes to the OS being as a resource manager. Okay, now let's take a look at some examples on how the operating system accomplishes or performs the responsibilities that it is supposed to accomplish or to do, to perform. Let's start with virtualizing the CPU. So a system can have a single processor. So normally during the early days, most hardware is composed of or are composed of a single processor only so you only have uh, one execution unit but as mentioned earlier by virtualizing this single processor we can have a seemingly infinite number of CPUs 
allowing many programs to seemingly run at once. Let's take a look at an example in a Linux machine. So I will use the top command to show the running programs in this particular machine and I will press 1 and as you can see here that I only have a single CPU in this machine but I have a lot of commands here that seem that are running seems to be running at the same time so this is the idea of virtualizing the uh, CPU okay, so I only have one physical processor core but it allows several programs to execute uh, somehow concurrently now let's take a look at an example of sample code on how this is accomplished so uh, I think it's better to show the Linux code so this is also available on the course website so you can uh, try this on your own but let's illustrate this so since we're talking about CPU virtualization so let's have uh, let's take a look at here uh, this is the uh, code so it's simple code it's a main function which accepts arguments it checks if the argument it has it checks if it has a command line argument if you run this without a command line argument it will exit and then it will simply uh, go into an infinite loop but and display the parameter and we have a function called spin here so spin is actually inside defined in the command.h so this is the spin so basically it just does nothing okay, for a given amount of time how long so if you look at cpu.c this means that uh, it will wait for one second. So let's try to compile this. So I invoke the program without a command line argument, so it prompts me to. this is the code so it simply outputs the character a every one second I press ctrl c to stop the execution so at this point we have a single instance of cpu running as plug uh, it displays a now we have we, as i mentioned a while ago we only have one cpu in this one processor in this particular virtual machine. Now, if we run uh, this code in this manner, so you will notice that there is A and B being displayed in the code. So, in press Control C. A is still running. Press Ctrl C. So it will not stop. So I have to put it in the foreground first. Then I think I made a mistake. So here. So here we have two processes okay, with different process IDs and A and B here so you can split this centrally so 
So we have uh, two processes here. Okay, so so this command line here tells the operating system to run these processes in the background okay so what i've shown you is an example of the execution of these two same programs but different instances displaying a and b running in a single processor right? and that's uh, an interesting way or uh, one of the mechanisms on how the operating system virtualizes the CPU. So we have uh, one processor but we have uh, two processes that displays one that displays A and the other displays B. Okay, as a side note, let's talk about policies and mechanisms. So, as a resource manager, an OS needs to implement mechanisms and uh, enforce policies. Mechanism is basically the how. For example, how do we allow multiple programs to run at once, given that we only have a single processor? When mechanism is the use of a timer. Now, for the policy, uh, example which program should uh, run first if you have is it the one that with a or is it the one with B right. so we have what you call uh, scheduling policies like round robin shortest job first etc which we will discuss later okay so we move on now next to virtualizing the uh, memory. Now, the physical memory, the one that you buy when you are assembling your gaming rig, is what you call the physical memory. It's usually a fixed size. Typical is 8 gigabyte in typical laptops and it's actually access an array of bytes. Each location in the physical memory is identified by an address when talking about arrays, you can think of this as the index of the array. And the program keeps all of its data structures in memory, which is accessed through various instructions. So remember you have a loader that loads the program from the disk to the main memory. The von Neumann architecture requires the, that the programs should remain in memory for it to be executed. And once the data is in, mem in main memory, normally operations like reading a particular area in memory via the load instruction. So here you have to specify the address to be able to read or access the data. And then you have the write memory, which is the store instruction. So you have to specify the data to be given, uh, to be stored in the given address. So the load instruction will fetch data while the store instruction will place data in the slot in the physical memory. It's important to understand or to remember also that the instructions or code that manipulate the data structures are also in the main memory. So let's have an example here. Uh, that illustrates how memory is virtualized. So in summary, the idea of virtualizing memory is it provides an illusion that a process has access to all the 
entire physical memory even though it does not have access to that okay to be able to do this uh, to, to be able to test this example we need to disable Uh, mitigation technique okay uh, okay so this uh, kernel parameter enables by default enables uh, address space randomization now to be able to test the example we need to disable this address space layout randomization using this uh, command in Linux so it's now zero so let's go back so the code that we're interested in is the mem.c okay. what it does is again it accepts a command line argument mem and some value and then it allocates it defines a pointer variable p it allocates an int the big test or make ensures that memory is allocated on the heap and then what it does is to print the process id and then the the value of the address and then we have a loop here that simply is an infinite loop delays for one second increments the value p and displays the value p here so remember there's a difference between this one this one you're displaying the address this one this, you're displaying the value the incremented value so let's test this. So again, it requires a parameter. So as you can see in this example, let's press Control C. So this is the process ID when I run this program and then this is the address of P okay. it's the address of P and this is the value of P now let's try to run this program let's run several instances of this program Let's see the result. Okay. Okay, let's press Control C. Uh, let me repeat the step. Okay. So You can see here there are two processes 7121 uh, and 7122 these are process IDs and uh, even though these are different instances of the program the address P they have the same value how can that happen right there should be uh, two different uh, locations for these values because as you can see in the succeeding outputs for 7122 for process 7122 the value is 101 but you have 
the same address as 7121 but they're printing different values how is that how is this happening so this is because of uh, the virtualization of the memory okay so we have uh, two processes thinking that they have access to uh, an address the entire address space of or the entire physical memory so here is just uh, the textbook run okay so it is as if each running program has its own private memory and each running program has allocated memory at the same address in this case in this textbook we have this one but in our execution we have this uh, values here 48 bits for 64 bit uh, systems okay so each process access accesses its own private virtual other space and it's actually the operating system that maps the virtual address space to the physical memory uh, memory reference uh, within one running program does not affect the address space of other processes and as far as a running program is concerned it has physical memory all to itself as shown in the demonstration and uh, physical memory is a shared resource managed by the operating system okay so the next item is about concurrency okay, so the OS is juggling uh, many things at once uh, first running one process then another and so forth uh, this uh, will this lead to data inconsistencies and incorrect operation it surely will and we'll discuss different techniques and different problems associated with uh, concurrency and also modern multi-threaded programs also exhibit, exhibit the concurrency problem such as client server applications banking and fitness applications and even games so let's have uh, an example on concurrency So let's take a look at the code again. So we have thread C here. So Threads is one way to achieve uh, concurrency in the operating system. Normally, a process has a single thread of execution, but it is possible for a single program to have multiple threads of execution, shown here. So we're, go we're using the pthread library. You don't need to understand uh, this at this point, but let's take a look at the code. So we have here, this is what you call the thread function. This is what uh, the thread will do. So what it does is to simply uh, increment a counter variable de defined as a global variable, volatile uh, global variable counter here. And the thread will simply increment that counter uh, given the number of times. So in the main end, we have the main uh, function. Uh, so again, this program accepts a parameter, which is the number of loops, number of iterations. And then it creates two threads, uh, P1 and uh, P2, the third one. And we have specified the thread function when we create the thread. 
then we join the threads and then we output the final value so let's see how this works Say one hundred, one thousand, no problem. Let's say ten thousand, no problem. One hundred thousand, no problem. This is the expected final value because we have two threads. Uh, oops! So you can see the discrepancy here. So we're expecting should be expecting a correct value but we have uh, different values here why is this happening okay so this is called a race condition but we'll discuss the details of this later but uh, the idea is okay when we execute the code since we have a total number of a lot of iterations in the code, uh, it can result to different values because of the execution of the instructions. So why is this happening? Uh, the first one is the increment. Uh, we increment a shared counter, counter plus plus, which takes three instructions actually. When uh, remember that C is a high level programming language, and this syntax, counter plus plus, actually will be, in, will be converted to machine instructions depending on the instructions of architecture. In the case of the x86-64, the compiler generated three instructions for this increment syntax, high-level syntax. So we have uh, loading the value of the counter from memory into the register, incrementing it, and then storing it back to the memory. Okay. So these three instructions do not execute all at once or atomically, thus the race condition or the concurrency problem happens. Okay, so it's the it's important uh, the threads here are in the same program, the same address space, the same process, thus sharing access to the same data, which is the counter, which is different from the previous discussion on virtualizing memory. So. Uh, to illustrate this, uh, how the compiler generated the code, so we can uh, can just uh, look at the worker function. So this is the worker function here and you see uh, no. I think we should use the Intel syntax so that you will be able to understand the code So it has a different output at this point, but uh, oh no, so this, this is the L9, okay? So this is the generated code that actually implements the, that increments the counter, is actually composed of uh, three instructions.
So we'll stop here. Now let's talk about uh, persistence. From the previous discussion, we know that the typical computer system has a set of hardware components like the processor, the main memory, and the hard disk. And the von Neumann architecture requires that the program and the data should be in the main memory before the processor can access them. Now, unfortunately, the main memory is volatile, meaning when power is removed from the hardware, whatever is in the main memory will be lost. So the operating system, to make it more convenient to, for users to use, it has to provide a mechanism to be able to store the state of the computation so that the user can go back to the previous activities or tasks that he or she is doing. For example, if you're editing a, a document, when there is a brownout, you should be able to uh, at least recover a portion of your document so that you would have to redo or retype the document that you're working on. So that's the idea of persistence, uh, the service, the persistent service provided by the operating system. How does the uh, operating system accomplish this persistence? And it requires two components. First, we have the hardware and, of course, the software. These two must uh, work together in order to achieve persistence. The hardware provides the, it's basically the input-output device and there are two main uh, classes that are commonly used nowadays. We have the hard disk drive, which is the classic storage device. This has a mechanical part. Uh, it has a platter and a head, read and write head that uh, rotates around uh, the, the platter. And the more modern one is called, are called the SSDs or the solid state drives, which has no mechanical parts or no moving parts but somehow it's still limited in terms of capacity. Now for the software component, um, just having the hardware will not be enough. So it has, there should be a piece of software that will allow, that will manage the contents of this hardware of this disk. And the abstraction used in operating system for that are called, it's called the file system. So for example, uh, when you open your computer and then you go to the My Computer and you click on a particular drive, then you see the, the file organization in that particular drive. The layout and the representation of that is called the file system. In Linux, for example, we also have a file system and there are different types of file systems. And we're going to discuss some of them later. For example, in the Windows, we have the NTFS uh, and for Linux we have by default in Ubuntu we have EXT4. So these file systems, these are the names of the file systems that they they describe how the disk is organized and how to make it more accessible to users. They have different properties in terms of performance and reliability. And uh, the main unit of information or the main storage unit when it comes to persistence in operating system are called files. So you have your C, C source code that is considered as a file, your Word document that is called a file, the executables or programs, they are called files, images, they are called files. So this storage, unit of storage are stored on the disk. Now it is important to remember that the OS does not create a private virtualized disk for each program or application. The idea here is uh, the files should be accessible to different programs. So for example, if you have a, if you're writing a program, a C code, the text editor should be able to read your C source code and then load it in the text editor. Then it will the text editor will allow you to perform edits and then save that back to a file. 
then the compiler should be able to read the file created from the by the text editor and use it as input in the compilation process. So it assumes that the files will be shared across all programs or users. Now let's take a look at an example of uh, the persistence mechanisms provided by the operating system. So we have here uh, the file name for this is io.c from the source code. Uh, and I think it's better if you look at the source code itself. Okay, so let's take a look at the code. So what this code supposedly is doing is it uses various system calls to be able to store or to create a file in the in this path absolute path slash temp file and then it uses the system call open and this system call will have several parameters or options that will determine the characteristics of the file that will be open and if the system call is successful it will return a file descriptor fd then we have a check here to make sure that there is we have a valid file descriptor normally the file descriptor is an integer and it should be greater than zero if successful then we have a buffer here which is an array of characters and then we place the string hello world in this buffer then after that we have the right system call which accepts the which has the file descriptor parameter which create which was which was created in the open system call then the buffer where the data to write to the file will come from and then the number of characters or the length of the buffer and then this write system call will return the total number of bytes written to the file and we have an assert check here to make sure that we were able to write all the contents of the file of the stream and then we do some housekeeping uh, synchronizing the file descriptor and finally closing the file so let's take a look at the example the description of the system calls so let's start with the open system call. so as you can see in the description from the non page in the first option the first uh, version of the on the system call is the one used in the example program and let's also take a look at the right system call so you see the parameters for the right system call here and the fsync so the fsync system call here actually uh, tries to synchronize whatever is in the memory and in the actual storage device so we'll discuss this later uh, we have what we call uh, caches to speed up processing but the idea here is to synchronize whatever is in the main memory and into the and in the storage device so that they will have the same contents and then lastly let's take a look at the close system call which closes the file descriptor and we have this empty. so as you can see in the in this linux example when doing uh when, when invoking uh, operations regarding persistence we usually have the file descriptor or fd as a reference to, to a file or to uh, whatever location now let's take a look at the 
temp folder. So currently, these are the contents of the temp folder, and there are there's no file here, as you can see. And when we compile the program. Then we run this program and then we check again the contents of the directory. We should see a file here which was the newly created file and if we want to view the contents of that file then we have the string hello world. So this is what we mean by persistence. The operating system provided a mechanism for the user to create a file within the file system and the created file the file was created by our uh, io.elf but the program cat uh, the cat program actually allowed us to allowed us to view the contents of the created file. So there are two programs involved here. One is io.elf and the other one is CAD. So I hope that uh, discussion is clear to you. So the question now is how, uh, what are the things that the OS does to write to the disk? Okay. So again, it depends on the I/O device, but the first step is to figure out where on the disk this new data will reside. Now the file system type will determine uh, where in the disk that will be located. And then after determining that, the OS will issue an I/O request. Okay, and uh, this request will be passed down to the to the actual device, device controller, this controller, by a piece of software called the device driver. Okay, so we have the device driver, which is the one that directly communicates with the this controller to issue the I/O commands. Now, during this operation, it's possible that certain events might happen that will corrupt whatever data is being written to, to the secondary storage device or the disk. So, most file systems implement a form of a recovery mechanism. An example would be uh, journaling or, or the copy on write. And what it what this does is to carefully reorder the writes to the disk so that in case there is a failure, the contents can still be recovered. It's also important in when it comes to persistence efficiency. Right? So it is a known fact that this access is slower than uh, main memory access so when designing algorithms or deciding where to store the data to the disk some efficient algorithms must be developed in order to improve the efficiency and of course one way to do this is to use uh, high performance data structures like BTs, for example, is actually used in databases. Okay, so that ends the section on persistence. Now let's take a look at the design goals. Okay, so when building an operating system, it's just like building any type of uh, software and it requires some uh, high level designs also and the goal is to 
build up uh, some obstructions. For example, an example of obstruction is how do you represent a running program? Right? So we'll discuss that in the next uh, video. But the idea here is, okay, we want our software to be able to uh, be able to allow the user to con conveniently use the hardware, then we must develop uh, instructions to accomplish that. Another design goal is provide high performance. Okay? And since the operating system is a complex piece of software, I often tell my students that write an operating system in order to apply all the things that you learn in computer science. Uh, when designing an OS, it's also, your, the designer is also faced with different design considerations. And since there are many components, the overhead of the interaction of these components and their operation should be minimized. Okay? And of course, since there is virtualization, by default, it, there, will, there will always be some overhead. And this overhead will come in the form of uh, extra computing time or extra space. So we try to minimize this overhead. Then another goal is protection between applications and between applications and the OS. So the OS is a special piece of software. So should be, it should be untouched by uh, other applications. And one application should also be protected from another application. So there is a concept of isolation so that the bad behavior of one program will not affect the execution of another program. Then the next one is a high degree of reliability. So the operating system is continuously running even though you're not doing anything with your computer as long as the there is power in your computer the operating system is always running so it should be very uh, reliable meaning when a problem occurs you don't have to reset or reboot your computer to be able to continue using it there should be some fail-safe mechanism such that when a process or a program misbehaves, it will not affect the entire system. It will uh, the erring process or program will not affect other programs. You will still be able to use the system. Let's say the Firefox crashes, it will not affect word processor or, or Microsoft Word. Uh, for other issues, we have uh, energy efficiency, especially in mobile devices. The operating si when designing operating systems for mobile devices, uh, the energy efficiency should be considered. So, the mobile OS should not drain too much power. Then the next one is security. So, of course, we want to protect data. So, when designing uh, an operating system uh, you, should, you should try to make sure that attackers will not be able to access protected information and then lastly mobility which is common nowadays and the operating system should be able to function in mobile devices okay so that ends the section on the design goals. So the important thing to remember is that designing an operating system requires a lot of considerations and design decisions will be made. Now let's look at some history of operating systems. It's important so that 
we get a a view of the progress and the evolution of different operating systems. So during the early days, the operating system is not existent. Sometimes it's just called the libraries. And uh, an example of this will be for doing low level input output. So instead of the application programmer coding the reading and writing to the disk, why not just provide a library that the application programmer can call? Okay? And this is actually present during the old days when we have uh, still have mainframes wherein there is a human operator that actually accepts jobs from the user, say the form of punch cards, and then uh, insert this punch card uh, to the mainframe. And this is called basically batch processing. So the jobs are run by batch and basically the, the process is non-interactive. So once the job is submitted, you can't do anything. You simply wait for the output. You don't know whether the output is correct or not. If it is incorrect, you have to resubmit another job or another batch. After the libraries, there is the, the concept of protection was uh, conceptualized. And the idea here is that, the, as I mentioned earlier, the OS is some kind of a special piece of software, so it somehow should be protected. And it should be treated differently than ordinary application code, because the OS is more privileged. So the way to achieve that is by the invention of the system calls, which was uh, introduced in the Atlas computing system. And to accomplish the system call, special hardware uh, was developed, hardware instructions and hardware state. So by introducing these instructions and state, the distinction between the operating system and an ordinary program has become a more formal and a controlled process. What's the difference between an ordinary system call and an ordinary procedure call? Well, uh, they basically perform a jump, okay? but the system call differs from the ordinary procedure call or function call in that it traces the privilege level of the hardware and uh, before it turns or executes the instructions, which is part of the operating system. This is done by what we call the drop instruction. And once that happens, the processor is now executing in what we call the kernel mode, or a more privileged mode. The other side is called the user mode, wherein you have uh, some restrictions when it comes to the set of instructions and operations that a program can do or can execute. So this is an important development uh, in operating system, the separation of the kernel mode and the user mode. Then comes the multiprogramming era. Now, in the in this in the previous era, in this era in beyond libraries, there is all, still only one program in the main memory. Okay? But with the introduction of the mini computer, the hardware became more accessible to users, and there is an increased developer activity because of that and multiprogramming was introduced this means that we can load multiple jobs in the memory and then to be able to simulate the 
concurrent execution of these jobs the switching of these jobs was introduced and this is in a way improved the CPU utilization because sometimes when a job is doing nothing the CPU is idle so why not run another job on the CPU to make it to make the uh, to improve the utilization of the CPU then just switch back again when uh, the waiting job is uh, ready to ready to run okay and because of this the concept of memory protection was also introduced because you, no, you now have several jobs in the main memory and one job or program cannot just access the memory of another program so we have memory protection and since we have simulta uh, several jobs running concurrency problems also uh, arose so we have to deal with these concurrency problems and a very influential development or important development in the multiprogramming era is the introduction of the Unix operating system so most of the studies or the things the concepts that we are studying in this class is actually uh, was actually introduced by the Unix operating system even Linux is was influenced the design of Linux was influenced by the Unix operating system and Minix now for the modern era so we have now the personal computer uh, actually in the, in the 90s right, we have the personal computer in every almost everyone can own a computer and the operating system then was the, called the disk operating system or DOS which was very limited and poor, poorly designed uh, before the modern era we have Linux or we have Unix which runs on mini computer and it has a solid design so we have uh, workstations actually during those days and the OS has a solid design now here comes the personal computer the operating system is somehow the design is somehow very primitive primitive because one is the limited hardware resources limited amount of memory and the processor let's say was intel 88 8888 which is or 8080 which is still has limited uh, computing power so DOS has no protection whatsoever and it's a single user but uh, over the years the there was an improvement in terms of the hardware so the design also has improved and uh, we now have somehow a more modern operating system design especially with the introduction of Linux which can run a personal computer so Linux is uh, a Unix type operating system but it can run on a personal computer unlike uh, the Unix operating systems before they require a specialized hardware with higher capacities processing capacities and of course after DOS Microsoft introduced Windows in several iterations and it has improved greatly in terms of the various design goals that I discussed earlier so in terms of security in terms of performance uh, in terms of obstructions etc so it has greatly improved currently where I think uh, Windows is introducing uh, Windows 11 and of course the Mac okay so the design of the Mac is more geared toward performance and uh, ease of use Okay, so productivity for producti improving productivity of its users so that's the focus of this particular operating system and then of course we have nowadays we have mobile devices 
and of course the Android operating system, which runs most majority of the Android devices or mobile devices, is uh, sits on top of uh, Linux also. So uh, there is really indeed a great improvement in terms of uh, the design of operating systems. Okay, so this concludes this chapter. I hope you got an overview of the basic concepts or what an operating system provides and the design goals when, let's say, if you want to, be, to design or create your own operating system.